I'm Teresa Wiedrich from Capturing the Charmed Life. I'm here to help you turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. If you are a homeschool mama challenged by doubt, not sure you can do this homeschool thing, if you're challenged by overwhelm, feel like you've got too much going on and too many kids to do it with, well then, this homeschool podcast is for you. Sarah Gorner began homeschooling her three children in 2008. Her and her husband believe they would provide their child with a more individualized education, which would also provide a progression of mastery of concepts and develop independent learning skills. Alongside traditional academics, the Gorner family enjoys hiking, camping, fishing, birding, and cross-country skiing. During COVID, Sarah has worked to maintain a sense of community with online activities and meetings with with her Colorado-based Green Mountain Area Homeschoolers Group. She's seen this difficult year as a time to grow and adapt and explore new avenues for the group and for her family. She can be found on her blog, thehappinessheer.com. Welcome, Sarah. Would you tell me and the listeners about your family, about how you got into homeschooling and introduce your kids? So I have a family of five, my husband and three boys. We're all about boys here. I have right now, my kids are 19, 17, and 14. And we started homeschooling when my oldest was just going into second grade, so seven. And we've just kept going since then. He's now a sophomore in college. We are in a very similar scenario because I have a 19-year-old that's also in her second year and a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old that actually started school for the first time this year, and an 11-year-old just about to be 12-year-old. So we have very similar stories. So my my oldest went to public school for um, the first two years, and I always tell people, you know, it was fine. And I guess it, it really was. It wasn't, there weren't any huge issues or anything. I think that I want to think that everybody has this sense that their kid is gifted, that there's something special that needs to be brought out in their children. And homeschooling gives you an opportunity to do that. So I want to encourage people to recognize those gifts in their kids and really, um, if they can, and if they want to, to homeschooling, you know, to homeschool, it's not... It's not certainly not the answer for everybody, but it was for us. Sometimes when people ask me why I homeschool, a lot of times I just say, well, because we can. Freedom. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a much longer answer. And I think, I think sort of a condensed version of it is just that all of our kids have all these unique gifts and homeschooling gives you the opportunity to recognize what those gifts are, promote those gifts and allow them to go at their own pace, whether it's faster in some areas or slower in others. That is very true. So much freedom. For me, it's always that word freedom. This year, I think a whole bunch of people entered the homeschool world, as we all know, and not for freedom. So I think they're, I wouldn't even say they're necessarily homeschooling as much as they were learning at home. And it wasn't a freedom package. A very different experience than probably what both of us began in homeschooling. Right. And I, I feel um, really bad for a lot of those people because it's, uh, it's not their choice. It, and I, I think it's, it's wonderful to be able to have a choice. And for a lot of people, public school is a great place to be and their kids do really well. And so their lives just aren't, you know, this isn't what they signed up for. So I, you know, I know that those people who are, they're kind of temporarily homeschooling and that's fine. And I want to support them as, as best we can, knowing that they will return to public school when they can. Homeschooling can be a challenge on a good day. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of organizing. Sometimes it's overwhelming. Sometimes you've got people around you that are making you or asking you why you're doing it. And so then you doubt you know, you have to deal with your frustration or the intensity that some moments bring throughout the days, trying to engage a bunch of different kids or engage grumpy kids, or, you know, you fill in the blank. It's like, I think many people have said this, but it's parenting on amphetamines. It's a lot. 
So for us as, you know, fairly seasoned homeschoolers, we've been there, done that for a long time. But what kind of advice would you give to this tsunami wave of homeschoolers? Oh, gosh, I think it's a a lot of the same things you say, just about taking care of yourself. Because if you if you don't take care of yourself, how can you really hope to take care of your kids? And and that can be as simple as trying to get enough sleep, (laughs) (laughs) which, you know, especially if you've got really little ones or if you're trying to work on the side, too, that can be hard. But you really have to try and take as good a care of yourself as you can, because that's that's how you can be the best for your kids and really set them up to succeed. And also, I think that we're able to, a lot of what I feel as a homeschool school parent is I need to model that so my children know how to do their own self-care to do what they need to, to succeed in work or, or parenting down the road, way down the road, yeah, <laughs> or, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah, and yet it feels like overnight they were so little and now all of a sudden they're big. Everybody said that would happen, but because of those first early years where we were so exhausted, we thought surely this will never happen. And then it does. That yeah. sleep angle, I yeah. think is such a big Um, important one. And yet it really can be elusive when you have younger kids. And, you know, I had my youngest had sleeping issues when we we traveled, we did a lot of traveling. And we went up to the Arctic for one summer, when he was three or four. And that daylight all day really messed with his sleep cycles. And so we had to help him shift away back to something normal. But it actually took years for him to come back to a normal sleep cycle, which meant that I'm underslept. And he's my fourth. So (laughs) my lack of sleep has been long brewing. And now I'm heading into that perimenopausal phase. So now I'm waking up just because I'm not sure why. And, you know, sleep can be elusive right across the spectrum. But I know a lot of people will say that it's actually the most important thing to maintain sanity to create, you know, healthy sleep hygiene. Is that something that you remember from back in the day? And how how did you tackle that? First, recognizing that you're not at your best, because um, sometimes when, if you're having issues, and we all have, <laughs> we all have our really awesome days, and then we have our not so awesome days. <laughs> and so I think it's important to recognize that sometimes those not so awesome days are not just what is going on with your kids, but what's going on with you too. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to like say, oh, it's, you know, it's all your fault if you're having a horrible homeschooling day, but you just need to recognize that you're not at your best. And, and if you haven't had enough sleep, you're gonna, you know, your fuse is going to be shorter. Your, you know, just everything is going to be harder. And so that's not to make, I mean, it's okay. It, It happens. And And one of the things that I always kind of laugh about that I say is that, you know, as our kids get older, they'll need to deal with people who are not at their best. Just think of it as you're giving them good life skills in dealing with (laughs) somebody who's... Yeah, my 17-year-old is working in service industry right now. She has said that she actually likes people less now because she has to deal with people, the most unpleasant aspects of people. But I think it's one of the best ways to get um, training for pretty much any job later. So when you were talking about taking care of yourself so you can take care of other people like our homeschooled kids, it sounds so cliche. It certainly sounds cliche because I'm always saying it. So I might actually be hearkening back to the thing that I'm always drilling from my own experience. It bore out in my practical experience. I got to the point of feeling truly burned out. I don't know that I would have described it that way at that time. I described it in this picture that I had had enough of people not wanting to do what I wanted them to do. I lost my marbles one morning and told them they were going to get on the yellow school bus. Because <laughs> that's, you know, a rite of passage for homeschool moms. We always will threaten that at some point. I didn't really want to do that. I just didn't want all the things that were going on at the time. Someone directed me to a Brene Brown video on YouTube. 
a TEDx video. I think I identified with what she'd shared in that video, that I was just not a person with boundaries. And I was trying to do everything for everybody. And But first and foremost, I was trying to do homeschooling perfectly the way that I had in my mind to do it perfectly. That journey, I mean, that journey still continues to try and unravel that. But it was at that point that I identified that taking care of me really impacts my kids directly, just like you said, when you're having one of those days, because those days are real. You know, I think it's just when you think you have it all figured out, your kids get older a little bit, they enter a new phase or just things change. I feel like it's, it's a getting comfortable with that sense that everything's always evolving and you'll never quite have it figured out exactly. I like to think I'm not, all three of my boys are competitive swimmers, which is funny because neither my husband or I are, you know, we're ever into swimming. I've done some swimming and I feel like when I'm swimming well, I have this sense where, you know, when I'm doing freestyle, like my head is half underwater and I'm just on the verge of not getting enough air or something or not, you know, it's like I'm halfway drowning, but I'm not. And it's a little bit like that. (laughs) I love that. I don't don't love that, but I know that. So thank you for sharing that. But that's, it's kind of this sense that, oh, I'm swimming really well, but I doesn't, you know, I'm still half underwater. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great image. Yeah, it's a GIF. We should make a GIF out of that. (laughs) I think most homeschool moms can identify, at least in the, in maybe after the first year. I don't know. Everybody has different experiences, but within the first year, for sure, there is this feeling of, whoa, I'm sinking. So would you describe that as overwhelm or do you have a different word you would attach to that image? Well, I would use it more as just a a kind of getting, just getting comfortable with the fact that I don't know anybody who's ever gotten it all figured out. And it's just, you meet the new challenges with Uh, you say, okay, this is, you know, I mean, perfect example, COVID, that has really changed our life in a lot of ways. People said, oh, you're homeschooling, so it's not any different for you, but it's very different for us because we typically do a lot of things with our homeschool group where we have big group outings. We do a lot of community volunteering. We do a lot of really cool field trips to just interesting little businesses and and all these things that we just can't do anymore. And so it's it's sad the things we can't do right now. I mean, we're fine. And I think you have to recognize that, that it's okay to be sad about that. But then you kind of think, okay, what can we do? What can we change? And And so I think that's Although we've never had to deal with something like COVID before, there's always, you know, something's a little bit changed or a little bit different. And so to me, that's, I really like being creative and finding out, you know, figuring out new solutions to challenges. And while I haven't embraced COVID as this great thing, (laughs) I have tried to look at it as something like, okay, let's figure out how we can make things work. That. That is beautiful. That reminds me of a story that Edith Eager, Dr. Edith Eager, had shared on a a YouTube video not long ago. She's um, a psychologist who was a child or 16-year-old dancer in Auschwitz. And she said that I decided that I could still make a choice. I could decide uh, this is a little harsh, but I mean, at the time, there were a lot of people toward the end there that were choosing to eat bodies but she decided to make the choice to eat blades of grass and she would spend her day being selective about choosing different blades of grass well now when you look at things historically covid there's any number of things in history that have been horrific and relatively speaking it's it's not that bad but it's still you know it's still important to to recognize that there's you know, there's things we've, we've kind of lost and yeah, acknowledge I, that's true, but also be yeah. able to acknowledge that we have choices and how we're going to perceive things. So how do you foster your community when it's so radically changed? 
Well, we are doing a lot on Zoom. <laughs> Hi, yes, we're on Zoom right yeah. now. <laughs> um, yeah, we've we've gotten pretty creative with that. We have our youth public speaking group. Actually, earlier this fall, we were doing public speaking at a park wearing masks spread out, yeah. which was kind of great because the kids really had to work on, on their skills of projecting. But then it was, we do that group in the evening. And so the last couple meetings, we were under a street lamp in the park and we were freezing. And (laughs) so we've just moved to Zoom. And for that, I think I always really tried to foster a sense of comfort. And I really want my kids and the other kids in our group and actually any kids that I come across to feel very comfortable with public speaking because it was, it's never been my forte. <laughs> and I think it's such, an um, cool. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's such an important skill. And so you think, well, we can't do it in person. And there's so many things you miss out from being able to do it in person. At the same time, so much of our lives have moved online. It's so convenient. Both of my older kids have interviewed for different things online in the past year. They've, my oldest one has done career fairs online. And so it's just very convenient. And it's not, even if COVID went away tomorrow, it's not going to go away. So it's a good, it's a good opportunity for us to work on online speaking skills. Uh, Yeah, that actually, I haven't heard that um, experience that kids actually had to project farther because kids were farther away from them. But that really is a great advantage. Mm -hmm. When we had three teenagers at home during isolation, that was challenging. It changed the dynamics because just like you, unbeknownst to most people, we just didn't stay home. It wasn't a thing that we did. We didn't have the kids locked in the basement and people didn't need to worry about socialization like they, they were. They may need to worry about it after in the isolation or the lockdown. But I found that really challenging emotionally to deal with the more, you know, the greater intensity of all of that. Did you find that yourself? When this first all hit in March, I mean, just everything shut down. And we were very much at home and right in each other's space. Did you know the movie Groundhog Day? Yes. It just it just felt like every day was the same. And it's been fine. We've I think that we tend to do a lot of outdoor activities. We do a lot of hiking. Uh, over the summer we did a lot of camping. So that has really been our saving grace over this time is that we we tend to do a lot as a family together. Anyways, and we've sort of we kind of developed this rhythm. You know, when things change with schedules, with whether you're moving into summer or you're kind of starting back to school, it's always a little bit of a di- disruption. And then you kind of find your rhythm. Mm-hmm. And so I think that we sort of found our rhythm. It wasn't our normal rhythm and it still isn't, but you know, it works. And I did want to mention, we are still able to do some of our, our homeschool group outings. Now that may change this winter, but we have been able to do a few. It's just kind of complicated to organize because we have to to get everybody in pods, you know, where we have groups of eight or 10, like when we went to the botanic gardens and and things like we're doing a little bit of that, but I'm just trying to be really creative with figuring out other, other ways that we're trying to do a Christmas holiday program for a assisted living facility that we normally visit every December. And I think we've been going there six or seven years and we're putting together a video Mm -hmm. this year where people will play the piano or do whatever, send me the video and we'll put it together. That's a great idea. So have you found that it's affected how you're feeling about homeschooling or have you been challenged yourself in it? I think that I think the thing that has most affected us has been the fact that we can't do so many community oriented activities because I draw from a lot of what we learn out in the community and pull that into our curriculum. So I don't think that's the piece that has really, really changed. I feel like our homeschool curriculum is always evolving and changing anyway. So 
we value <laughs> similar things because you write down your interests like hiking and canoeing we do here uh, we have kayaks in the area as well but cross-country skiing all of those things right outside of our door and enjoy all the benefits of nature. And I agree with you that that's, that was like the saving grace of the real lockdown period. But the truth be told is I'm not that mom that wants to be out and about all the time anyways. So I was like, totally good for this. But my 17 year old said, yo, mom, this is like Groundhog Day. She said the same thing you said, that this is way yeah. too much. It's the same yeah. thing every day. Well, I, I tend to be, I think of myself as more of an introverted person. I love being out learning new things and connecting with people, but I am a definite, uh, I recharge with, you know, alone time and I'm a little bit the same. It's some of it's not all bad. <laughs> right. So do you find you can get alone time outside of your kids or do you mean alone time in the same house with your kids? You know, it's a combination. Sometimes we're near a fairly large open space here. So I'll, I'll go off and, and take a hike on the weekends, but No, I enjoy, okay, not 100% of the time, but I do (laughs) mostly enjoy hanging out with my with my kids. And so, you know, if one of them wants to go for a hike with me or whatever, it's, I mean, I feel like we're, what do I want to say? We're not a perfect family, but what we get, (laughs) (laughs) but we're all pretty easygoing. So it's a, you know, and my husband works from home. He actually has for about four years, he's, he's worked from home. And so that may not have worked as well when the kids were really little, but now it's pretty good, especially since he has some of the projects they get into require a little bit more of his engineering expertise. That's perfect. So then you've had to build boundaries in how you engage homeschooling while you have someone working from home and you've kind of established those boundaries over the years that's actually one of the biggest thing people ask me is how do we homeschool and also work from home yeah well it I don't know it it works for us but we do not have a huge house it just takes some shuffling around and I don't know (laughs) so I notice you have exercise classes online this is available to anyone? Yes, it is. I do it. I have taught exercise for, I've taught fitness classes since way back in the 80s. Gosh, I've, it's just been a kind of small side part of my life through everything else I've done. Kind of led me to pursue a degree in physical therapy. Now I, I teach fitness and I have this background in, in physical therapy that helps me as well. But I have consistently taught my, well, I mean, I've taught since uh, way before my kids were born, but I continued to teach. And with that lack of sleep thing, it didn't always work really well because I teach very early morning. I usually teach around 5.30 or 6 in the morning. When I was first offered those, that time frame, I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding. But I'm like, okay, I'll try it. And it worked out perfectly because... I'm able to, and it still works out perfectly. I get my workout in before my kids get up. Uh, the only problem is like by, by 10 o'clock some mornings, I'm ready for a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teaching from my house in the morning at 5.30, two mornings a week. And, so well, what classes do you I, offer? I do a barefoot cardio class, which is... Oh, I don't know how much you want me to go into it because I can talk about feet stuff forever, but it's training with your feet. We do a lot where we, all of us just stuff our feet into hopefully pretty good shoes, but those shoes hold your feet in a really controlled position. And so you don't really develop those muscles in your feet to help you balance and perform. And it affects everything above. That's a very short <laughs> version You know, my daughter actually just auditioned for a ballet school, so she has very strong feet, even after an ankle break a few years ago, but I know exactly what you mean, and I couldn't fathom putting my feet, my very wide feet, into point shoes. (laughs) Yeah, well, I don't do any of that. Uh, No, I'm not graceful enough to... I've never done ballet. I was certified in Zumba, but it just was not great at it because it was took too much of my brain to think through the coordination of it. So 
I do a barefoot class and then I do a free weight, free weight class that I think is also very important because as we get older, I don't know, most people are getting older, maybe not you, but um, <laughs> yeah, as, getting older. my neck is telling me that I tried to do calisthenics. Older, and... We tend to lose, lose muscle mass. And so that component of using weights becomes even more important. We've moved online with the class. I still try to establish a strong sense of community because I feel like fitness, it's always nice to have a little bit of accountability. I'm all for going off and running and hiking on my own, but I also like connecting with other people and helping them just become more fit because it makes you feel better. It gets you through the rest of your life a lot easier. I think my youngest was just eight months or maybe six months old, and I was trying to climb up the stairs from the first floor, and I was just huffing and puffing. That was when I determined that it doesn't matter how I'm going to make it happen, but I got I have to include exercise, and it didn't actually it didn't take as much time to lose the pre baby weight that you know for my fourth child. Although truth be told, I mean. It's hard to tell after that many kids if I've really lost it or regained and then lose it and regain. But exercise, no matter my diet isn't clean, like my dancing girls, there's occasions that, I, yeah, over the weekend, I have eaten a few peanut M&Ms. <laughs> they're very clean eaters and they're really great examples for me. But when it comes to exercise, that's like a guaranteed tension burner. I think it's super useful for us, especially as homeschool moms to step away from whatever we're doing some point of the day. I couldn't. I find just the tension burning aspect of it really helpful. I know how hard it is when I think about talking, how do you schedule an exercise? That is really challenging when you have little kids that are like, you know, at your feet while you're trying to do calisthenics or something. Right. right. And, and I really feel like I have cheated by having this job, you know, this, I have to show up for these people. And so I do. It makes me exercise. So when the kids were very little and I wasn't sleeping very much at all, I knew that I got in my two workouts a week at least. You know, that was my bare minimum. I got that in because I had to. But when you don't have to, it's hard. And so I think, you know, always just go easy on yourself. And if at the very least, just get outside, outside. You'll move a little bit. You'll get some hopefully sun and fresh air and you'll feel better. Sometimes it's not the time to say, okay, I'm going to homeschool my kids and I'm going to start homeschooling my kids. I'm going to run a marathon and I'm going to, (laughs) you know, I know a few people that have done marathons. Does that, does that rub off on me? (laughs) No, no. I mean, people, people do it, but you know, I, I don't know. I think when we were talking about, especially these people who have, Come into homeschooling not as as a choice. It's just what they have to do. I think it's it's really just be easy on yourself. I mean, but just say I'm going to try the best I can to to do whatever to exercise to help my kids be the best that they can be or whatever. And but understand that it's just really small gains. Every, you know, it's rarely a giant leap. You know. <laughs> Yeah, instilling these habits on the regular, even if they're really tiny bits of time in your week or in your day. But if you get into the habit of saying, okay, every day we're going to exercise, we're going to have a little dance party in the living room, or we're going to go jump on the trampoline. That's something that (laughs) huge exercise, if you can actually get coordinated on a trampoline, but just a little bit every day, then you, you build a habit. Well, don't you feel like that's the same thing with homeschooling too? It's just, you know, just a little bit, just chipping away a little bit. I always tell people if, you know, you do a little bit of reading every day, you do a little bit of math and you do a little bit of writing. And if that's all you get done, that's okay. That's great. <laughs> or if you only, you know, if you just do one of those three days a week, a little, you know, whatever. Right. As long as you're just consistent. Yeah. It's about building a routine. I heard this a lot. I had a lot of questions about, well, how do I create a schedule for my day in the beginning of the isolation? And I wanted to say, whoa, stop, please don't. 
you're just going to get really frustrated with your kids. You are going to recognize that you are not accomplishing the thing that you thought you could accomplish that no one or very few homeschool families will do for a couple decades is create like a school at home. So instead of creating a school at home, create a routine, a routine of activities you want to include every day. And when you don't, it's okay. Then you get to be flexible, but you know, you're going to go back to it because this is your routine. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I've, I've also tried to, especially as my kids have gotten older, I've tried to give them a lot of control over their schedule and um, have them, I mean, they, I think it's important to do that, to let them say, I want to start with the this first. And, you know, when I first started homeschooling, I was like, okay, at nine o'clock, we're going to do this. And at nine 30, we're going to, and I think everybody has to go through that and figure out, oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> oh, it's some sort of self-torture. I was, I, was, I was like, oh, I'm going to get the hardest thing out of the way. And my kids, do, they want to like ease into it. They're giving them, a, you know, some things there's, there's not really a choice you need to do this for sure, but there's some different ways you can achieve it. You make the choice on that. Building flexibility. I remember you saying earlier that you try to facilitate teaching your kids their self-care as well. Can you give us a few examples of how you're trying to help your children take care of themselves? I was thinking about self-care because I know that is a huge focus for you, imparting that, the importance of that to homeschoolers. And I was trying to think, what does self-care mean to me? I think the the biggest, if I had to come up with one phrase for it, I would say self-confidence. And I remember when I first started homeschooling, I read something somewhere that said, you know, it was like this checklist of things that you need to be able to, you know, qualities you need to have to be a good homeschooler. And like top of the list was self-confidence. I was like, oh no. (laughs) Because at that point I was like, I just wanted somebody to tell me that, oh, come on, I know you can homeschool. I think you're going to be great at it and your kids are going to turn out awesome. And you know, you kind of want that at the beginning. And then as you go along, you you kind of get it and you're like, all right, I need to be confident in what I'm doing. And it's not something you can say, okay, I need to be self-confident. I'm going to be self-confident. And then you are, (laughs) you just have to work towards it. And, and I think it's the same thing for my kids. I want them to have some confidence in themselves that they can make the right decisions that they, that they have the tools to do whatever they want to do. And so I think um, I want them to develop self-confidence now ways I've tried to help them do that are through a lot of our curriculum that we do, which is we do a lot through the Jane Goodall Roots and Shoots program, which is a a youth-led service learning program we've done every year. And that's where students identify a problem in their community and then figure out solutions and work towards that. So that's really a youth-led initiative. Having them work through that, I think, just naturally develops self-confidence and a lot of it is being, as a parent, being able to tell yourself, okay, I may, I may not be doing perfectly, but I've got this. <laughs> you know, I, I've got it. I, I may have to adjust and I'm going to stumble sometimes, but I've got it or, in a, or I'll figure out how to, you know, fix it. So I've got it again if, if things break a long way. I think with, with kids, you want them to be, develop that, you know, when they meet a new challenge, they have this sense that, okay, this is going to be hard. How am I going to do this? And problem solve through that and then say, I've got, you know, I guess that's sort of a foundational thing. And then I'll, self-care for them has developed into kind of healthy, pretty healthy um, lifestyles. They all like to swim. They like to work out. They like to hike and camp. And that's not something you can say, you have to exercise. You have to go outside. You have to 
kind of lead them to want that and lead them to embrace that lifestyle that's going to make them healthier. Mm -hmm. More is caught than taught in pretty much any parenting area, which sounds like it's useful in at certain moments <laughs> and it's not so useful at other moments but I yeah we set the example for them you had talked about self-confidence as the basis and I, that is intriguing to me I actually heard someone say that you have to want to hang out with your kids that would be your number one thing which like you said some days I do and some days I don't and mostly I do but there's certain moments, right, that I would happily get rid of those. But it turns out that's part of their development and their growth and mine too. We often have doubts because, well, I don't think that we are convinced that it works until we're around long enough to realize, yes, it does. And we also have a lot of people around us that are always questioning what we're doing. And also most of us grew up in uh, conventionally or we were educated in a conventional approach. So then we don't think outside brick and mortar box that says that you actually could learn outside of teachers and grades and testing and et cetera. But we have all those doubts, guessing that we also have other doubts. So then how to build self-confidence? It's just going along, evolving, you know, being willing to change things if something isn't working and figuring out what does work. What inspires you? For me, a lot of it is history. We do a lot of history-based teaching or learning with our homeschooling, and it doesn't really matter what your thing is. For me, it's history. If I had to pick one, one subject, for me, it's history. And it doesn't, you know, maybe for you, it's math, whatever it is, your kids are going <laughs> to, you're shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not math. Yeah. But you have to find the things that that excite you, that you can impart that excitement to your kids. And you find different ways. History to me, I mean, we can put it into science. We can put it into our writing. We can use it in so many different ways. And it's all stories. We love to read. So that's been a big foundation for my, my homeschooling curriculum that we use. To go back to your question about how do you get self-confidence, I think it's just finding the things that excite and inspire you and moving in that direction and everything else, math or whatever you don't like, you'll find the resources to get through that. You'll find the, the curriculum or the people who can help you as you go along. So then you focus on the things that you want to do instead of listening to all the voices around that say you can't do this or feel confident in being able to do this, but rather just focus on your own interests or your own passions? I think one of the things, I don't know what your experience is with this, Teresa, but I think one of the the hardest things with homeschooling for me, having been in it for a fair amount of time, is that as students hit middle school and high school, a lot of them migrate back to the public school system, which is, it's fine. You know, people need to do what they, what works for them. Um, But that, that I think has been the hardest part of homeschooling for me, running a homeschool group to have, to really work on nurturing this sense of community and um, really connect with these students. And our main connection, our main thing we have in common is homeschooling. And so when they move out back to, back to public school, sometimes we can keep that contact, but a lot of times we don't. We just, mm-hmm. you know, you get busy. And so I think that's the, the hardest part. But then you just you have new people coming in and it's fun to have new people and help them along. And you just develop, this, this is my path and we're going on, you know, and, and in your students too, your, your kids have them get this sense of this is my path. This is, is why we're doing this. And this is we're just going to, I think I'm kind of stubborn. I'm like, this is just who we are. <laughs> I said that too. Just I got to tell you, I was at, when you say that, I'm like, yeah, my firstborn had a heck of a time trying to convince me to go to school because I'm like, uh, that's not what we do. And I'm a homeschool mom, but actually I learned and she, I mean, I required the essay and I required a 
lot of stuff. I really wanted her to think through the choice that you're making. And my second daughter hasn't gone to high school, public high school. And my third daughter is for the first time ever going to school, didn't even go to kindergarten. Now she's going to grade 10 in this year. And I've learned to trust the fact that it is sometimes them having to become their own person and then create their own adventure or their own story. And I think reality is when they were kids, like you're like little kids, they're still kids. But when they were little kids, that was never something that would happen. They were cute little kids that I would have memories or stories with, but they weren't human beings that would grow up and have very, you know, parallel existence with me, but not be the same people as me. And for me, that's about trusting and allowing them to grow up and become who they were meant to be. And I think part of the reason, though, specifically for my kids is there really isn't a community of homeschool high schoolers where we are. And so all their friends already were at that school. But they know that I adore homeschooling for all its freedoms, but and have definitely wanted that path for each of them until I realized it wasn't about me. Very challenging. Oh, it's not. It's not. not. (laughs) I really feel like, especially as they get to, to high school, they need, they really need this independence to feel like they have their, uh, a sense of self and you can accomplish that in different ways. I think that, that, there's certainly going to high school is can be a wonderful experience too. I know several kids who have done that and it's, you know, um, generally they get in there and, and the school is super easy, the school part of it, and they fit in fine socially, of course, and um, been a great experience. Our kids have, they do sports with the high school. They swim with the boys high school swim team. They've done some internship programs that are through through the high school, like the county high school program. Then they've also gone to, we have a local community college here. So that's been nice to give them an avenue to kind of be, be, have their own thing. And plus, you know, it just kind of is, has been a good way to make sure that I've really been teaching them because <laughs> they've, oh, yeah. they've done all the yeah. community college classes. Now, when the kids start to graduate into that, Newfeld Institute describes it, or Gordon Newfeld describes it as individuating, and they're becoming their own person. When they start to do that, and they're moving in that path towards young adulthood, then often homeschool moms are left with the question, okay, what do I do now? Because the homeschool thing is going to last forever. Have you had that experience? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I have to say that the I've been meaning to get a blog going for oh years. <laughs> this past nine months or whatever it's been have really been a time for me to say, okay, I'm I'm going to do this because I feel like I have a lot to share. Anybody who's been in homeschooling for a while has some things to share, different perspectives, and I think all of us want to help nurture other people who are looking at this saying, hmm, is that something I want to do? Or how could I do it? Ultimately, homeschoolers are such a diverse lot and so independent minded, you know, which is great. And it it just is, is part of the package that everybody needs to find their own way. But I think it's wonderful. All the other people out there like you who have resources and tips and advice and down to earth, you know, you're not going to be perfect. Or if you are, tell me what you, what you're doing. (laughs) I'm not, you should come over. (laughs) You'll see you'd be a fly on the wall. That would be perfect. Then you'd be like, Oh, okay. No, I'm not. But yeah, so that's, um, that's what I'm doing. I, I'm still feel like I've discovered some, some great programs out there that we've been able to incorporate into our homeschool through the Jane Goodall Institute, through National History Day, through just through our community that that I think if you look, there are so many opportunity, very cool opportunities out there for homeschoolers to to discover and 
and participate in and mm-hmm. find different paths. Would you say that as a, home, a homeschool mom, that you have grown up alongside your children as well? Oh, no, not at all. I haven't experienced <laughs> any personal growth. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might be a toss up in who has matured more them or me <laughs> amen girlfriend I just think gosh if I what is that if I knew then what I know now you wouldn't have had this amazing journey right that's true I mean certainly I would do things differently that's life you, that's you do everyone wrong and you pick yourself up and you figure out how to do it right and and you explain to your kids that you're not perfect, you didn't get enough sleep. <laughs> and and you and you go on. But yes, I have I have grown so much and I have I have learned so much. Algebra two, three times, you're finally finally starting to get it the third time around, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I won't claim that I've got it all actually. <laughs> Well, you know the resources to use. I do know the resources. Yes. And I lean heavily on the idea, especially because of math, that my, well, A, my husband is actually very capable of this, but I'm also highly dependent on Steve Demi of Matthew C. What's great is when you can have them explain things to you. And that's a big thing that I have tried to, I feel like all of us are teachers. I don't care what you end up doing, but Every single job I've had, you know, some were more obvious than others, but every single role I've had, you have to teach, you have to be able to tell other people how to do things. Or if you're, you know, low man on the totem pole, you have to be able to tell people why something isn't working. So, you know, we're all teachers. And I learned early on that talking slower and louder isn't the answer. Tell me what you would say one of your fun self-care strategies are. Oh, my fun self-care strategies. That that kind of sounds like I should be going to a spa or yeah. something, right? Right now, really, it's hiking um, or running. Other times I like to, I am not a great artist, but I love sitting down and painting something don't ask to see anything I've painted, but I like, you know, I like doing creative stuff. It Oil, takes me watercolors? Uh, usually acrylic because then if I don't like the color, it, dry, it dries really fast. and I can paint over it. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oils are challenging because everything good. kind of melds together and becomes gray if I'm painting. Yeah. I, yeah. I, so I like doing, I like doing stuff like that and I enjoy reading. A lot. I'm a big reader. I I read a lot of fiction, but I also kind of like skimming through self help books. I find a lot of things. A lot of things that are written for adults can be applied to not just me, but my kids as well, because they're going to be adults, or they already are adults. <laughs> what advice would you give to the new homeschool mamas about their self care strategies? I think uh, go easy on yourself, take care of yourself, try and move, exercise, expect things out of your kids, expect things out of yourself, but don't expect to be perfect. I mean, set goals. If it doesn't work one day, that doesn't mean you give up and, and go out and change your curriculum totally. But if it's not working after whatever you determine is a reasonable amount of time, whether it's a week or a month or whatever, then maybe you need to try a different approach and that's okay. It just, you know, stick with it long enough to make sure that, that you've really given it a chance, whatever you're doing, whether it's things that you're trying to do for yourself, as far as either like meditation or exercise or trying to get that sleep or, you know, whatever, or if it's curriculum you're trying with your, with your kids, just persevere but be willing to change when you need to. And that's easy to say and harder to do. I really want to tell all these people who are thinking, who are homeschooling and like, maybe I want to do this longer. Maybe I want to continue doing it or they're thinking of homeschooling. I want to tell them that if you really, you know, if you really want to do it, you can. Anybody can. It doesn't matter if you're 
horrible at math. It doesn't matter if whatever, you know, as long as you want to make it fit with, with your kids' needs, you can do it. Beautiful. What would you normally be doing on a Friday night? Huh. On a Friday night? Well, on a Friday night, Friday night is movie night yes. here at our household. So <laughs> we are typically watching a movie and we tend to like we tend to like comedies. We usually watch a movie. That is our exciting Friday night. Me too. Sometimes with the pizza. I saw on your website that you focus on gluten-free. And so I've actually come into awareness of this cauliflower crust, which is actually really good. Oh, yeah. 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 So we do, we do eat, half of my family is gluten-free. And um, it was I was laughing a little when you were talking earlier, I think about eating and not always eating right. Because if you look at my website and you look at the gluten-free recipes, it's all desserts. I mean, it's like 99%. <laughs> and we don't just eat desserts. <laughs> but those are the things that are really, you know, I feel like it's super easy to change main dish, whatever, into gluten-free to, to cook dinners and everything else gluten-free the the hard thing is the store-bought stuff for breads and any baked goods it's just awful before we were doing gluten-free I bet I love baking it's like magic you mix together this dough and you put it in the oven and it comes out completely different that's chemistry in action for me that's the only chemistry I sort of understand very well so I think it's important to, to eat well, but also to treat yourself too. I think I might've treated myself to a few too many little mini bags of peanut M&Ms this weekend. Tell me what is on your book or your bookshelf or what you're reading right now on your nightstand. I've been trying to read um, this book called See No Stranger by, by Valerie Cower. It's a very hard book to read because it's it's her experience growing up, in her words, growing up brown in California. She's an activist. It was just her, her life experiences after 9-11 and just since then. And so I go through fiction books so fast that I can't tell you what I read recently, <laughs> even though it was this week. I can't think of the title, but I like reading women's fiction, just, you know, stuff with some depth to it, but generally that has a good ending because like I said, there's enough bad stuff in the news. When I'm being entertained, I want to read something that ends well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your website's name is The Happiness Here. You it's on thehappinessheer.com. So tell me The Happiness Here, where did you get that name? Yeah, I've been in the, there's been a lot of literature out in the past several years about happiness. I read a book, I believe it was called The Happiness Advantage. I'm not positive on that. I can picture the cover, but I think it was The Happiness Advantage. And it was talking about how all these studies have been done on why people aren't happy. The focus was this, somebody who did research at Harvard looking at not what makes people unhappy, but what makes them happy. So there's, there's a growing body of, of evidence and it's, you know, it's in titles everywhere. Now people are a little obsessed with being happy. <laughs> I think it's kind of one of, it can be one of those things where it's like, well, if you're not worried about a lack of a job or you know, extreme poverty, then you can start to worry about whether you're happy or not, you know, True. beyond mm -hmm. actually just surviving. So it's, I think it's a little bit of, I, I just want to focus on the fact that whether you're homeschooling or whatever you're doing, you have that happiness inside you. You know, you have the ability, no matter what your life situation is, I mean, certainly it's easier to find that when you have a roof over your head, food on the table, you know, a lot of people think they always need more, you know, that it's something down the road. Well, when I do whatever, then I'll be happier. When, when my kid gets into Harvard because I hold homeschooled them so well or whatever, I'll be happy then. It's just important to develop a sense that, yeah, you can always have more money or you can have more whatever people 
define as success, but, but really that happiness, come, you know, it's just discovering it within you and, and seeing that, recognizing that. That's beautiful. That's really well said. Yeah, I think we have an infatuation with the idea of happy as well. But I somehow also think that it's a gravitational pull that nobody is gravitationally pulled towards suffering. We'll get it. So don't worry, it'll happen. But we're kind of pulled towards happy. Actually, I don't really know the origin of my blog. Um, I called Capturing the Charmed Life. But I did at a certain point realize that it can't be done. And also, it's a gravitational pull towards wanting that, just like you said, happy. So what are you going to do when that moment of suffering or challenge comes? Then you're going to want to turn it into a charm. Where can we find you online? You can find me at thehappinessyear.com. And you can find me on Instagram. Instagram, I'm Sarah13go. And then on Facebook, I'm thehappinessyear.com. It has been a real pleasure to chat with you today, Sarah. It was lovely oh, to it's been you so fun to talk to you, too. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. I'd love to hear more about who you are. So come on over to my Facebook or Instagram page, Homeschool Mama Self-Care. Or my upcoming book, Homeschool Mama Self-Care, Thrive, Not Just Survive. Head over to my blog, www.capturingthecharmlife. You'll also find the show notes and links to everything you've heard in this episode. And until next time, I hope you can turn your challenges into your charms.